everyone. Um, I'm John Duff. I'm a plant, plant protectionist with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries based at Gatton. We did a case study with a local potato grower. He had a serious issue with verticillium wilt in his buds. He was interested in cover cropping options and one of the cover crop options he was looking at was brassica biofumigants. And he got a hold of some of the work that we had been doing over the years, asked us to come and have a chat, and we started him down the track of using these as part of his crop rotation program. So just uh, up, some information on verticillium wilt or verticillium dalii. Um, it does reduce your tuber size, which then subsequently gives you a yield loss. Plants can die prematurely in the paddock, so instead of being a three-month crop, you may only get a two-month crop. It then impacts future potato production. This pathogen can survive in the soil for at least five years, so every time you put another crop in, you're going to get the disease actually affecting that subsequent crop. This grower did try numerous crop rotations, uh, sorghum, corn, and they didn't even seem to affect the severity of the disease. It just kept getting worse and worse. So we looked at, there's a predictive PT test, which the South Australian Department of Research, uh, Research Institute, SARDI, have been doing for a number of years in a number of different crops. They have a whole range of pathogens that they test for. And this tests for the DNA present in the soil. We, we were particularly interested in the verticillium wilt, the bottom one, but it does give you results for all of these other tests that are in that test panel. And they give you some indication of risk cate categories of just a few of them. Again, the bottom one, the verticillium wilt, is what we were more interested in. Now, with regards to the number of samples that we needed to take, each block that we sampled was run about five hectares in size. So we really only needed to take two to three samples, but because we wanted to sh look at the overall distribution within each block, we looked at anything up to 10 samples in that five hectare area. A little bit of an overkill, um, I must admit, but it gave us a really good picture of how evenly or otherwise actual diseases were in that block. And just remember, Verticin and Wilt, high levels were above 20, what they call picograms. The PG is picograms of DNA per gram of soil. Oops, going too fast. Oh, next one. So we looked at the samples we sent. As you can see, the levels of DNA of the various pathogens in the soil were well and truly in the red. Verticillium wilt, you have huge numbers like this paddock here, well into the thousands of picograms per gram of soil. So it's no wonder he was actually having issues uh, growing potatoes in these blocks. The only areas in this block seven numbers were relatively low, but they were still in the moderate range. So I'm just going to cover three of the pathogens. So verticillium wilt, which is the main one we're interested in, also the black dot, and uh, root knot nematodes. So helping this grower choose which biofumigants to, to grow, the work that we had been doing on the research station showed that BQ mulch and Caliente were two good candidates for this grower. They're readily available at the time. Unfortunately, BQ mulch has been withdrawn. The seed company that sold it doesn't sell it anymore and we can't seem to source, get a new source of that particular mix. It was a very good one. It flowered very quickly. 
uh, within 35 to 50 days, he could get it ploughed into the ground. We looked at, or we encouraged him to look at planting it over the hotter months of the year. The research that we shown, um, uh, that we did showed that the plants get stressed with heat and they produce more glucosinolates, which then in turn have a better result on controlling soil-borne pathogens. Not all varieties do that, but especially the VQ mulch was one which did that relatively well. Summer is really not the best time to be growing these. It doesn't produce as much biomass if it, compared to a winter planting, but the amount of glucosinolates or the chemical that they produce tended to outweigh that lack of biomass that you get. We also wanted to look at this as part of another project to help reduce soil loss and nutrient runoff from the blocks by showing that you could plant these crops during summer, uh, during our high rainy periods. Unfortunately, I guess if you'd planted them this summer, they might have actually been washed away with all the flooding that we have actually had. Um, but we did want to look at it from both a soil health point of view and also um, reducing runoff and from yeah, soil and nutrient runoff. So we did this during 2019, 2021 uh, on this grass property. And just a quick rundown on the processes that involved for those that aren't familiar with uh, Brassica biofumigants. Once they reach about 25% flowering, we then mulch with a flower mower. We want to get a really fine particle size. So the plant material has to be really well broken up so that you start getting that chemical reaction to produce the biofumigant effect. Ideally, it should be rotary hoed into the ground so you get the best penetration of the chemical. We have, on one occasion, the grower only had disc plows and we still got a relatively good result using the disc plows. Again, it is ideal to irrigate, but when you're talking about a five hectare block, to run the irrigator from one to the other, one end to the other, it would take far too long. The chemical that produced in this biofumigation process volatilizes very quickly. So the other option that the grower had to them was to use a rollers behind a tractor and that helped to seal the chemical into the ground for longer um, than if he hadn't done it at all. So that's basically the process involved with when using biofumigants, or the Brassica biofumigants anyway. Oops. So just remember, this is just looking, starting off looking at verticillium wilt. Numbers were exceptionally high. His first biofumigants was incorporated just before Christmas in 2019. Oops, oh, you're going backwards. And as you can see, even just one planting of biofumigants reduced numbers considerably. Well over 90% and even 95% reduction in the actual numbers of DNA, or DNA particles within the soil. So a huge effect, the grower was ecstatic. He had wanted to look at two plantings close together of the Brassica biofumigants. So he still went ahead and did that. These were incorporated May the same year, uh, 2020. And the results, he did get slightly different results, not as, you wouldn't say hugely beneficial, but it still kept numbers exceptionally low compared to what they were when we first started collecting soil samples from this block, these blocks. So the grower felt that this was a huge success um, and was happy to start planting potatoes back into these blocks. 
Uh, where are we? So black dot was the other disease, which was exceptionally high numbers. Well over 40 picograms per gram of soil was well and truly into the red. It's the same process. Um, numbers were half, if not more, in some cases, but they're still in the red. So there's still a lot of work to be done. After a second incorporation or second planting of biofumigants, again, a slight improvement in numbers. If he keeps using these biofumigants as part of his crop rotation, it is likely that these numbers will continue to fall, but he needs to keep going with it. Biofumigants aren't just do it once, get a good result and leave it. You really need to keep at it. It needs to be part of your crop rotation program. So with nematodes, root knot nematodes, again, numbers are very high, well over 50. There's only one, two, or a number, three, four samples there, which were less than 50 picograms per gram of soil, which is in the red. He had a huge reduction in the efficacy in, or in the management of these um, nematodes after just one planting of biofumigants. And that even after two, almost none present in there. Now, I know some of you will think, well, brassicas are hosts of nematodes, and that's quite true. A lot of the work that we have done over the years has shown that basically all your brassica biofumigants are hosts of root knot nematodes and other nematodes, contrary to what the literature says. But when you incorporate the above ground plant material, which is exceptionally high in your glucosinolates, what effect does this then have on the nematode population? And this really clearly shows that it has a huge effect on it. So the roots may be ho harboring the nematodes, but when you incorporate the tops, you're getting a huge benefit at managing your nematodes. So with this last recent flooding we had, the grower did plant a crop of potatoes. Um, so I suggested he go down to the harbour and see whether he can salvage some. So he's probably out there trying to fish out his plants at the moment. Um, hopefully he's got more success. Um, and I'd just like to thank uh, researchers that helped me and the grower, Greg Hauser. Um, this is part of a Department of Environmental and Science funded project with um, our own Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. All right, that's Fantastic. me done. Thanks. Thanks, John.